know, when most people think of Mark Twain, I don't think France is the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> most people, of course, think of him in terms of the Mississippi or maybe California, Nevada, all kinds of places, but or the travels that he did in other places uh, around the world. But in fact, um, he had a very complicated, um, complex, and a vexed relationship to France. And what struck me about it as I began to learn about this is that most Twain biographers and scholars have tended to think of this as he hated France. I mean, it, it's almost been a throwaway line. His well-known antipathy for France. Um, that didn't seem to me to be in keeping with anything about Twain, because nothing about Twain is simple. He's an incredibly complex person who, you know, when galloping across cultural and historical and geographical and intellectual, and you know, he just covered in so many ways such a huge swath of everything about human experience that to simply say, he hated France, always struck me as um, not a serious uh, look at what his feelings might have been. So I also, at the same time, probably because I started studying French through a pilot program at the Abigail Adams Grammar School in Massachusetts, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I, I guess I would say that this project came about as I think many do, um, through kind of trying to force together two things that I was interested in and always loved. And not only was I interested in Twain since graduate school, um, but I have always loved France. And since I first came here when I was 16, tried to be here, tried to learn about it. I don't know why. I'm an Irish Catholic kid from Boston, but there you have it. <laughs> so, when I heard that he didn't, when I became a scholar and began to hear Twain conferences that he hated France, um, I wanted to put those two things together. And I wanted to really look at them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I also wanted to come back to France. <laughs> so it struck me as a perfect opportunity that I should somehow get a Fulbright to come here and, and examine what this was all about. Um, and I found that it to me, turned out to be um, Twain's using the French as a foil to create a new American identity at a time when France, after the Napoleonic Wars and the Franco-Prussian War, was really, you know, I mean, there was the Belle Epoque and the arts they were flowering, but on the sort of world stage, they were, they were suffering a diminished image. And the United States was really becoming the industrial power through much of this time, right after the Civil War, um, and stepping onto the world stage for the first time in a very powerful way. And I think Twain understood that on some level and used that opening to use the French as a foil to create a kind of new American identity that was neither the Eastern uh, identity of Emerson and Transcendentalists and all of that, nor was it the Western identity that many people associate with him, either in writing or in real life figures like, uh, you know, Wild Bill Hippo, right? He shifted the axis, in a way, from East to West. Sorry. Even from North to South, so that he really became an American writer, and I would argue, in some ways, the first fully American art writer, who was not in some way defined by those sort of geographical, um, you know, and, and literary uh, areas. And one of the ways he did this was by opposing in many things that he wrote throughout his life from the innocence abroad onward specifically opposing things about France to the U.S. So in fact, in something he writes, he says about it, it is un, it, it, let me see if I can get this quote quite right, he says it is um, uh, un, it is not American, it is not British, 
We are, no, I'm not going to get it right, I'm sorry. I'm, it's it's right in here. But he's saying it is on French. Who are we? We are the on French. Who are the Americans? We are the on French, right? And he does this quite specifically in his writing. So in looking further at this, it seemed as if even that wasn't a full enough explanation, although that I, I did find that kind of interesting. But um, it seemed as if the fact that he was born in Missouri in 1835, 30 years after it had been a French colony and part of the Louisiana you know, right. territory, was probably not coincidental. Right? Mm -hmm. His family was a family that um, was among those who came there to settle a part of Missouri that hadn't been settled before Hannibal. But just south of that, of course, is all of the territory that had been French territory. And, of course, the boats were coming up and down in the river. It seemed likely, although it's really hard to find any evidence of this, you can find plenty of evidence of the French in Louisiana and in the area south of Missouri, but none that really shows that people were getting off the boats in Hannibal, which they did, who were French Canadians coming down. But I think that's probably quite likely. I also think that the French, there was a specific effort to erase French culture, especially given the East-West access that I talked about, um, and to erase really the whole North-South access in favor of Manifest Destiny. It was so focused on what was going on with the movement West, right? But there was, in fact, a whole movement North-South up and down the Mississippi that went through entirely what had been French territory. And he, when he started working on the steamboats, did participate in it. He went down to, to New Orleans on the steamboats. He went to French restaurants. He writes about these in his journals. He went to French markets. But a lot of that um, history he, he takes from a historian named Francis, Francis Parkman, who I think some of you may know of, who was very specifically disparaging about French culture, um, any any sort of French Indian mixed culture, and Twain lifts a lot of those views, I think, of the French. Then he went out west, where and this was to, actually for me maybe the most interesting thing I um, found out in the in the course of the research for this, um, because of the revolutions in 1848 in France and in Europe, there were a lot of French who went to the gold rush. They were actually called the French 49ers. <coughs> and he went there, of course, 10 years later for the Comstock load around that time. But there was a whole French population in the Sierra Nevadas and in California and in San Francisco when he was a reporter. And he covers several events that relate to the French. For instance, he covers a murder trial of a man <coughs> who killed a woman who was, um, she was a very beloved figure in Virginia City, um, but, and she was a local prostitute, but she was also like the local mayor. And this man, who was part French, broke into her house and murdered her, and, and he robbed her. And he covers this trial and really emphasizes the fact that he is French. <clears throat> Whereas, when there are positive French influences, he ignores them completely. <laughs> so whenever there's something French that is bad in his reporting days, <laughs> something French that is good, he completely omits it. Right? So with all of that as a background, I'm going to stop soon because I want to read a section here. With all of that as a background, he went to France on the Quaker City tour. Well, he was actually going to the Holy Land, as they called it, but they stopped in France. And from that time on, he writes about France in ways that I think take these uh, pre-existing attitudes with it, right? And what I, what my co-author Ronald Jen, who is French and uh, teaches uh, translation studies, is a professor at the University of Lyon. What we noticed was that he characterizes the French in ways that are the exact opposite of the sort of pro Protestant. Um, identity in America, which he was, right? So Protestants are hardworking, 
and they're clean, and they're chaste, or at least repressed. Right? <laughs> the French are lazy, dirty, and obsessed with sex. Right? <laughs> and he harps on these things again and again and again in various ways until his last time he's in France is uh, 1894. Um, all in all, he spends only about a year, a year and a half, a year and three quarters of his life in France. But they are very fruitful times. And they really are times that he uses, again, to, by contradistinction, in opposition, to say, you know, we are the own French. We are, we are American. So I hope that sets up a bit what I'm going to read, which is several pages about the dread winter of 1879, when he was in France trying to finish a tramp abroad. Um, and most Twainiacs, as we call ourselves, most Twain scholars, biographers, um, date his hatred of France or his antipathy for France to that winter. But as you've just heard, that is not what, what uh, Ronald Jen and I think at all. So these are several pages from that chapter of the book. And this chapter is called Paris from the, from the Inside, and we begin it with a quote. Let us all aid in helping the Frenchmen. Let us take to our hearts this disparaged and depreciated link between man and the simian and raise him up to brotherhood with us. Um, a Tramp in Paris. No account of Mark Twain's relationship to France and the French would be complete without a look at the four months he spent with his family in Paris during the cold, rainy winter and spring of 1879. And it is certainly true that Twain struggled, but failed, to finish a tramp abroad in Paris while suffering from rheumatism and dysentery. I have been sick, sick, and sick again. I have spent four-fifths of my six weeks residence in Paris in bed, he wrote to his publisher, Frank Bliss, adding, this is an awful setback. I only got fairly and squarely to work again a week ago and had to go back to bed again today. <coughs> Hold on. Um, I am working every chance I get, and that's the best I can do. Nor did the bad weather help. As he complained in a business letter as late as early June, haven't had a day yet, which, I did, not, which did not require fires and overcoats. It is also undeniable that Tony <coughs> wrote nasty comments about the French in his notebooks. Among the most frequently quoted, for example, are, a Frenchman's home is where another man's wife is. <laughs> <laughs> and the one you've already heard a couple times now. French are the connecting link between man and the monkey. <laughs> but to isolate this short stretch of time as the wellspring for Twain's antipathy is to oversimplify or even distort the case. His attitudes about the French date back to all the earlier periods of his life, from his Missouri childhood to his Mississippi steamboating days, his Western newspaper reporting years, his first travel abroad, and his early experiences with French criticism. Beyond that, his bad feelings abated somewhat in future years, as he traveled in the south of France, immersed himself in the life of Joan of Arc, and found another French figure to admire in Zola. More important, though, the 1897 same Paris, and the vitriol it produced on Twain's part, calls for a fuller understanding in light of both newly discovered materials and a broader context for existing ones. Sorry, I'm still getting over the whole, so. In Paris. Because you're in Paris. Yes. It's not in France. <laughs> it's not raining. First, Twain complete, compiled during that time a carte de visite album. Do you all know what carte de visite are? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that creates his own who's who of contemporary France. Unknown until now, the album belies the idea that his only responses to the French during that unpleasant stay were to dislike them personally and demean their way of life. Throughout his life, Twain was as compelled to learn about the French as he was repelled by them and by their culture. 
and his 1879 Carte de Visite album offers further proof of his ambivalence. Second, many of his most egregious comments that Twain wrote in his 1879 notebooks were actually notes for what would become unpublished French chapters of a French abroad, of, sorry, of a tramp abroad. While those chapters are indeed hateful in many ways, they also reveal that Twain had a larger plan in mind for the book. As imagined during, this time, during his time in Paris, it was to include an entire section, which he later removed, that created a ranked scale of civilizations. The French were at the bottom, of course, but the important point is the reverse. The Americans were at the top. In Twain's contrarian schema, they would act as nothing less than the civilizing force the French needed to move beyond barbarianism. So yet again, the French serve as Twain's foil, his way in to saying good things about Americans. Twain's notebook comments from 1879 did not simply vent his spleen over France and its culture. They were prompts for material that would elevate America and its culture, though most of it would never see print. James Leonard writes that Twain, quote, believed exuberantly in the American way of doing things. And sometimes it took the French way to show how good the American way was. In fact, Twain had gone to Paris with his family <clears throat> to try to finish a book intended as a sequel to his first travelogue, The Innocents Abroad, which itself used the French as a foil. As even the title makes clear, he hoped to tramp abroad would recapture some of the earlier work's free will narrative, not to mention its critical and financial success. Twain had begun writing it in Germany as an account of a, quote, walking tour of Europe that he and his close friend Joe Twitchell had made the previous August and September. The men had spent six weeks on their tramp, which, as Twain admitted, actually entailed little travel by foot. <laughs> As he wrote to William Dean Howells, I am in pedestrian costume, as a general thing, and start on pedestrian tours, but mount the first conveyance that offers, making but slight explanation or excuse, and endeavoring to seem unconscious that this is not legitimate pedestrianizing. In late February of 1879, the Clemenses left Munich, where Twain had begun writing a tramp abroad, and headed to Paris. As published in 1890, A Tramp Abroad mostly contains accounts of places and experience in Germany and Switzerland, with a few chapters at the end set in Italy. In terms of France, the final version had only two chapters, one set in Chamonix, and that relates more to the village at the foot of Mont Blanc than to France itself. The other, The Great French Duel. Do any of you know this? It's really hilarious if you have a chance to read it. The Great French Duel, which satirized the duel between two French politicians of the day, became chapter eight. To understand both the unpublished and published French chapters in context, it helps to look at various aspects of Twain's life in Paris, including his work arrangements, his participation in the social group called the American Colony, his pastimes, such as the Carte de Visite album and his reading, and his outings to French events. Taken together, they create a larger frame for Twain's vicious expressions against the French, which have generally been considered free-floating dislike, the octagon of Montmartre. Before leaving Germany for Paris, Twain had jotted down the address of Goupy et Compagnie, the international art and engraving dealers, planning to work with them on illustrations for his book. He also wrote to Alessia Bliss on March 6th that Quote, six days hence, an artist a mile from here, on top of the hill of Montmartre, will yield up his studio to me until my book shall be finished, and on that day I will buckle down on my book again. He seems to be reassuring not just Bliss, but himself, that he will soon have the right working conditions to finish his book in a secluded, quiet spot. The Montmartre studio belonged to an American painter, Francis Millet, whom the Clemens had befriended when Millet had painted Twain's portrait several years earlier. Montmartre, which had become a tourist spot, which has become a tourist spot, but nonetheless remains a favorite neighborhood for artists and writers, has one of the most spectacular panoramas of Paris. 
Until 1960, it had been a separate village on the northern outskirts of the city. Clement's wife, Livy, too, was enthusiastic about his working in Millet's house. It is perfectly charming. His house is so very artistic, and his studio was filled with interesting things that he had bought from the East with him. The address listed for Millet's studio on French documents from the time was 8 Rue de Lorient, which later became Rue de Ramé de Lorient. Millet's studio was just east of the famous Sacre Coeur Basilica, then under construction. And Twain really never mentions that, interestingly, in his, in his, I mean, he can't have been very far away while this building was going on. Um, and off the ancient Coup Peak that climbs Montre Hill, where famous artists, including Van Gogh, would soon live during the Belle Epoque of the 1880s. Since the Clemens family was staying at the Hotel Normandy in central Paris, near the Louvre, Twain went back and forth to his writing den, though he does not mention whether he habitually walked or took a carriage. Either way, he passed almost daily through typical Parisian scenes of Parisian life. While the studies hilltop location and the separation it provided between his domestic life and his writing recall the octagonal study Twain's sister-in-law Supreme had built for him on the hill above Quarry Farm in Elmira, where he had worked so successfully in the summer since 1874. Writing in Millet's studio required him to cross to a busy, noisy, urban scene. Although he also doesn't say if the street sounds of Montmartre bothered him, he does complain in a letter um, to Alders, to Thomas Bailey Alders, who was then the editor of uh, The Atlantic, uh, about the noises at the Hotel Normandy. The whole trouble was the maddening street noise. Move bedroom and workroom to the other side of the house. And now I sleep like a lamb and write like a lion. I mean the kind of lion that writes. <laughs> Regardless, he started out with high hopes for finishing a tramp abroad quickly that soon evaporated. Millet's study had become available because of his marriage only two weeks after the Clemenses arrived to Elizabeth Merrill, which was the Parisian, which was the Paris social event of the season for Americans of their set. On March 11th, a wedding party that included the Clemens, sculptor uh, Augustine St. Gaudens, and painter, uh, painters Leslie Pease Barnum and William Gurney Bunce, gathered at the City Hall of the 18th arrondissement. Clemens himself served as a witness, and the wedding certificate unearthed among official French documents. We actually found this and have a photograph of it, and he's you know, clearly signed it. But curiously, he signed it, or at least the, the language next to his signature um, lists him as several years younger than he is. <laughs> it says Clement Samuel, he's more than 40 at that time. <clears throat> as for the ceremony, it probably helped give Twain the idea for his comparative study of cultures that never made it into a tramp abroad, especially, as we will see, a chapter on marriage customs. To a man whose own wedding had taken place in his wife's parents' mansion in Elmira, with Twitchell and well-known preacher Thomas K. Beecher officiating, the French ceremony seemed strange indeed. Not only was it too bureaucratic for his taste, but it also pointed too suggestively to sexual acts. One detail that struck Twain that day at the local Parisian City Hall was a large sign reading Midwife. As he wrote in his journal, before the door of the Mary, where everybody must go to get married, is a sign which nobody can overlook in big letters, sage femme. To him, it evidently suggested that many French brides were already pregnant if they needed the services of a midwife. Certainly, it made the connection between marriage, sex, and procreation explicit and public. Also of particular interest to Twain must have been the difference between an American marriage license and the French acte de mariage, which he signed as the Millet's witness, when it came to parental consent. Instead of requiring only original birth certificates, as in the US, the French system called for written legal consent of parents. The Millet's, in fact, had to provide certificates issued by the American legation, certifying that by law of their home states, they could marry legally without the consent of their parents. Twain's American friends were granted an exception, but like any other couple getting married in France, they conceded to another bureaucratic French marriage requirement, 
they had to listen to the to the reading of the Code Civil on the duties and obligations of spouses. <laughs> Only after those customs had been observed did the Millets have a legal French marriage. These French customs may have made Twain appreciate the relative degree of liberty and self-determination he and Livy enjoyed during their own courtship and marriage. In any event, his experience at the Millet ceremony partly explains the long passage in his notebooks, where he comments on the French custom of marrying in City Hall first and only then at church. His reactions were only aggravated by a French book on manners he was reading, Le Monde et ses usages, by an author who was probably also using a pseudonym, Madame de Watteville. We did actually a lot of research into her and could not find her anywhere, and the name just sounds, uh, you know, like a cooked up like thing. Yeah. <laughs> Madame de Watteville. <laughs> 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 Together, they begin to answer the question of why Twain would devote an entire chapter of A Tramp, of, a tramp Abroad to courtship and marriage. Mm -hmm. Removed from A Tramp Abroad by Twain himself, and later considered too thin for publication <coughs> by the man who became uh, the editor for most of his later short stories, a man named Bernard de Voto. This material has remained obscure, only cited out of context occasionally to prove Twain's francophobia. The American Colony and French Outings. Twain's letters and journals from the time describe his active social life among the American Colony and the international crown. He met well-known writers and journalists whose fame was quickly being eclipsed by his own. The British journalist and novelist Richard Whiting, for example, the Norwegian-born American lecturer and man of letters, I don't know how to pronounce this first name, but I think it's Yamaha Boyesen. Others, such as Millet, were artists living and working in Paris, and a few, including Lu Lucius Fairchild and Baron Tauschnitz, were there in official capacity or for business. Twain clearly enjoyed himself socially among this group, despite his illness and the bad weather. It was not all gloom and discomfort, his first biographer, a man named Albert Bigelow Payne, writes. There was congenial company in Paris and dinner parties and a world of callers. Albert the scintillating was there, also Gedney Bruce of Hartford, Frank Millard and his wife, Boyson and his wife, and a Mr. and Mrs. Chamberlain, artist people whom the Clemenses met pleasantly in Italy. Turgenev, as in London, came to call, as did Baron Tauschnitz, that noble-born philanthropist of German publishers. Richard Whiting was also in Paris that winter, and there were plenty of young American painters whom it was good to know. Justin Kaplan agrees that Twain did not lack for a social life. As usual, he was feted and sought after, he writes. He drank from, I love this image, he drank from Turgenev's samovar, exchanged visits with him, gave him a copy of Tom Sawyer. With, with, with Conway and General Noyes, he went to a reception at President Clavis with Clara Spaulding and General Lucius Fairchild, the American consul in Paris. So busy was the Clemens' social life during those months, in fact, that at one point, he sent a note to his nephew, Sam Moffat, his sister Pamela's son, who was staying at the same hotel on a visit. Dear Sam, don't tell anybody but we are going to spend our evenings in my workroom, number 124, the fifth floor of this hotel, where you will be welcome. We are fleeing from these deluges of company. <laughs> Beyond all these visitors and engagements, there was the informal dining group known as the Stomach Club, where he gave his comic talk extolling the virtues of masturbation, some thoughts on the science of onanism. Noting its topic, as well as the interest Twain showed in sexually explicit French matchbook covers, and a letter he wrote about a friend's visits to, quote, those old cocks, Victor Hugo, and philosopher Ernest Renan, Ron Powers comments that Twain got to feeling a bit French himself. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was out and about as a tourist, taking short trips to see a famous horse race west of the city, or to Nanterre to see the Festival of the Rosières. He had a better time in Paris than the rest of the party. Uh, um, this is a quote from one of his biographers. He could come and go and mingle with the sociabilites socialite, social, when the abnormal weather kept the others housed in. He did a good deal of sightseeing of his own kind and once went up in a captive balloon. 
at the same time that Clemens's, the Clemens family was immersing itself in the French language. They were all studying French more or less, and they read histories and other books related to France. Twain himself was reading about the French Revolution, specifically the Reign of Terror. He reread Carlyle's book on it yet again, as well as A Tale of Two Cities by Dickens. Twain must have read Carlyle's book, I don't even know how many times, you know, 10 times, and was reading it very close to when he died. He was tremendously interested in French history. Uh, the family even went out to visit, quote, the scenes of that grim period on the rare occasion when the weather was good enough. Two outings in particular are worth noting. Twain's attendance at the reception held by President Jules Vallée in mid-March, and the side trip he took to see a traditional ceremony dating back to the Middle Ages that honored a girl chosen as the worthy bride of her village, its rose, at the crowning of the Nantes Postier. The presidential reception, which took place a month after the Clemenses had arrived in Paris, underscored both Twain's literary fame within the American colony and his prominent public image within Parisian circles. Although he had been invited secondhand by General Edward Noyes, a former Union Army general and ex-governor of Ohio, who was then the U.S. Minister to France, Twain was more than happy to go. I assure you I accept your invitation with a great many thanks, he wrote Noyes. Ray V held the after-dinner event at the Palais de l'Élysée, the French equivalent of the White House. Le Figaro announced on March 19th, with a single line that makes no mention of who was expected to attend, evidently because it was a weekly event. The French president and his wife received visitors every Thursday after dinner. Twain spent no more than an hour inside the Elysee that evening. Even so, it is striking that he makes no note about being in the French presidential palace at all, much as his, much as his writing in the early 1890s would ignore the fact that the Eiffel Tower, erected only a few years earlier, was located near their Paris apartment. It is as if Twain cannot bear to acknowledge, without slipping into satire, the grander aspects of life in Paris. For all he makes of it, his trip to the Elysee could have been just one of many places he stopped that night when he, would out, he stayed out until dawn. Another curious note about that night's reception was that Léon Gambetta, whom Twain had recently parodied, he's one of the French characters parodied in the great French duel, and he's on the losing side of the parody. Um, Gambetta was also there at that reception that night. He was then president of the Chamber of Deputies under Clavy, and given that Twain makes him a model of French cowardice in the piece, it is hard to imagine that the other Americans at the reception were not gossiping and chuckling at Gambetta's expense. Because the French translation would not be available until months later, the American party knew something that their fellow French guests did not, and the secret involved an American writer making fun of a French hero. While there is no report of the two famous men speaking, or even acknowledging one another, the incident again illustrates Twain's ability to ridicule the French on one level, while embracing the social status their culture afforded him on another. If not hypocritical, it is certainly ambivalent, and another indication that, in his dealings with the French, he was working out something larger that concerned American identity. As Powers and Kaplan have both pointed out, Twain's two-sided reaction to the French grew most intense when it came to sexual standards. The same man who was giving speeches about masturbation and writing letters about erections repeatedly expressed shock over French morals. Evidently, the Elysee reception only fired Twain up more. He discovered that he was at a social event attended by both French President Gravy's wife and the brother of his mistress, Marguerite Wilson. That guest, Daniel Wilson, was a representative on the French left and a friend of Gambetta. To Clemens and probably the other Americans there, it was shocking to see the President's wife and mistress's brother together in the same room on an official occasion. Twain's later francophobic outburst denounced the arrangements of French couples. One of the unpublished chapters of A Tramp Abroad, for, in for instance, declares, Statistics show that France has had 117 kings and emperors and presidents, two of whom have kept no mistresses, 
they died in early infancy. <laughs> <laughs> Elsewhere in his private notes, Twain writes, in countries where wives hold the first place in their husbands' hearts, the men govern the country. They govern it, receiving wise and unselfish counsel from their wives. The wives do not govern the country, but they do not govern its men. The wives do not govern, but concubines do govern the men, and in the very nature of things, they govern them with selfish ends in view. A nation, by which he means France here, governed in all its big and little details by foul and selfish and trivial-minded prostitutes is not likely to have much largeness or dignity of character. So I think I should stop and allow some questions. There's more, but you'll have to read the book. Yes. Who was his family? Did he have lots of children? I had the same question. Who was his Twain's family? family? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Twain's family is actually a, a tragedy all on its own. Twain um, married uh, a woman named Olivia, um, who, um, um, Langdon, who was from upstate New York, from Elmira, which was then a very wealthy industrialist area. Her father was a, a coal and other power business. Um, he met her because um, her younger brother was on the Quaker City tour that he took the first time he went to France. And he allegedly fell in love with a picture of her and came back and uh, met her. And um, I, I believe that their first date, they went to read, uh, they went to listen to Charles Dickens read in New York City. Um, at any rate, they got married and Twain, you know, for all intents and purposes, became a wealthy New Yorker for the rest of his life. And he was only, he was then about, I don't know how old he was, I'd have to do some math, but he was in his late 30s. He was fairly old when he got married, but um, he never, he went west. He went to Missouri only once or twice to visit. He never went to California again. He was, you know, traveling around Europe because he went bankrupt. Um, and he was a wealthy New Yorker, really. Um, they had three daughters. And for, uh, I don't know, a period of 15 or 20 years were, were quite happy until he invested in uh, something called a page typesetter, which was a total failure over the years, and he kept putting money into it, thinking it would revolutionize printing. Um, and their <coughs> oldest daughter was a daughter named Susie. She was named after her mother. Her name was Olivia, but they called her Susie. She went to Bryn Mawr for one year. And then it's there's a lot of scholarship about this. She had a relationship with a woman named Louise Brownell, and there's some thought that the Clemens were threatened by <coughs> this, but that it was a lesbian relationship, but you know, sexuality and relationships between women and women's colleges in those years were really quite fluid. Um, at any rate, they had Susie, and then they had middle daughter, Clara, and then they had a younger daughter, Jean, who was quite sickly, and it turned out had epilepsy. Mm -hmm. So Susie, um, the, the, they, when they went, when he was going bankrupt or broke, they left the States and were traveling in Europe, and Susie was with them. They were all together. But Susie came back. Uh, for a little while, and got um, uh, spinal meningitis and died when she was 24 in their house, their main house in Hartford, the mansion they built in Hartford. And it is, um, she really became um, delusional in the last, you know, 24 hours of her life or so, and wrote some incredibly, um, you know, touching delusions, and one of them was uh, there was a streetcar that came up the street in that part of Hartford in those days, and she wrote, uh, up come the trolley cars for Mark Twain's daughter, down go the trolley cars for Mark Twain's daughter. I mean, it's just... So Susie died, and they were not there, um, and he wrote that a man could... Uh, could uh, you know undergo that might be you not know, quite the right verb there a shock like this and live as one of the mysteries of mankind. They never recovered from her death. None of them. She was their great light. She was sort of the brilliant oldest daughter that they all, you know, thought was going to I don't know do what, but something really fascinating. And then Clara was um, you know an opera singer and musician. She's the only one who survived him. Uh, Jean was uh, hospitalized for epilepsy on and off, and finally died when she was, I think, 29. Um, she'd just been let out of the hospital, and they were living in suburban uh, New York. 
and she came home, decorated the Christmas tree on Christmas Eve, took a bath, and died of an epileptic, um, you know, seizure in the bathtub. And then his wife died, although she was sort of, you know, had a, had a heart situation. She'd been ill off and on for years, so she died several years before he did. So by the time Twain died, the only member of his family who survived him was his middle daughter, Clara, and she had one daughter who, um, that's not a good story either, her name was Nina, and um, she became an alcoholic and died young. There is a woman in recent years who claims to be Nina's daughter, but the genetic tests are clear. So most people think that there are no direct descendants of Mark Twain. Oh, uh, I, I missed the beginning of this, but was, was Mark Twain uh, bisexual? Um, most people think he actually wasn't. But there is some scholarship about you know him sleeping in the same bed with other minors or you know getting drunk and collapsing next to another reporter in the Bay Area. But um, if he was, he certainly lived a, you know, a robustly heterosexual life. <laughs> ever after meeting Libby. There's nothing, you know, before that. So, um, probably not, but you never know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the other question I have is very quick. Did you ever meet uh, Oscar Wilde? Yeah. That's a great story. They cross, <laughs> they cross paths in a hotel. Oh, yeah. And I think, yeah, I'm trying to remember if it was in Germany or in Italy. And um, Susie makes a note of it in one of her letters. And says something like, you know, um, met Oscar Wilde the other day. But that's all. Doesn't go on anything about it. So, yeah. But Susie, you know, is more, there's a lot more. If you're interested in that, there's a book by a woman named Linda Morris called Gender Play <coughs> and Mark Twain that talks a lot about Susie's relationship to Louise Brownell, who was her, herself a fascinating and accomplished woman. There, yeah. So why do you think he spent so much time in France? Was it to make this distinction with the states, or was it because he enjoyed the social life? I mean, no one was forcing him to be there, right? <laughs> no, no one was. I mean, he didn't really spend that much time in France compared to Italy oh, or Germany, but he did spend, years, right? you know, I think anybody who was of a certain social set had to have a relationship to France in those days, you know? <clears throat> if you wanted to climb up socially, you had to, and, you know, he claims that he didn't speak French. Well, he may not have had a good French accent, but he read French extremely well. He translated French extremely well. He knew French, and he knew a lot about French culture. And I think, again, that this was part of the ambivalence. You know, in order to be a, a civilized, cultured person, you had to have, you had to know French, you had to have a relationship to him. Um, but, you know, he resented that and wanted to flip that, and I think succeeded in some ways in doing that. Yeah. You know a lot about the fellow. Do you like him? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like him. I think I'd like to hang out with him because I think he was clearly, you know, a very smart and um, original and entertaining person. Um, there are some things about him that are very Victorian that I wouldn't respond to on anybody. The, the passage that I just read about men and wives and who governs whom. You know, he still has very much of that. He's still a very, um, even though he had daughters, and he, in many ways, um, he, had, he was very influenced by the women in his life. And Twain, who, of course, we think of as this kind of guy's guy, really led a, a life that was in a circle of women after he married Libby. But I think he had some very, um, the one thing I would say I don't like about him is I think he had, you know, sort of attitudes about women of, of his day, about their place in society, you know, that they should be wives and in the house and this sort of thing. Um, so that I don't like. But the rest of him I, I kind of do like. I've thought a lot about why Twain, because I initially uh, was studying literature by women, which would sort of make more obvious sense. Um, but I fell, in, I fell into this world of Twain by taking a course in Twain in graduate school, that's literally what happened. Um, and, um, you know, I used to be a newspaper reporter, and I always um, liked to sort of be out in the world in um, ways that are sort of right on the line between conventional and unconventional. I like to pass as a conventional person, but not really be one. And I think I respond to that in Twain. I think that's really what he, you know, what he did. 
Um, so there are things about him that I like quite a bit. He's certainly one of the more interesting people in American culture, and when you begin to to study him, you see why he is. It's like Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, you know. <laughs> He is iconic at that level, right? Um, and and I, I've come to understand why, I think. Yeah. What was his attitude to the Italians? Well, you know, he actually insulted a lot of uh, other people. <laughs> <laughs> Groups of people. Um, on a regular basis. Um, and he did some of that um, in, in Innocence Abroad, which is that first book about the trip. So they spend time in Italy, they spend time in the Azores, he insults the, in the Portuguese, is, you know, speaking in, uh, people in the Azores. So, you know, I think he had, had um, similar ideas about them as, you know, kind of dirty and oversexed, but, and he hated religion, he hated organized religion. So, um, but he directed more of that towards um, Protestant religion because he was raised as a Protestant. I think than the Catholic Church. Um, he also wrote, you know, that often ger that awful German language. I mean, he insulted many people, many groups of people. But he doesn't use them in that way. If you look at the pattern, he's not consistently raising the same things about them in order to distinguish them, in order to make to distinguish them as the opposite, or to distinguish Americans as the opposite and superiors of them. Yeah. Do you think his attitude towards the French at that time has continued on and, and maybe yeah, informed? Yeah. <coughs> there is an undercurrent <coughs> in American society yeah. today. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Do. Very much, yeah. I hear it again. People who don't know France at all have never been, yes. even outside the United States, and you wonder, where did they get this from? Yeah, no, I absolutely do. Yeah. And in fact, I wrote a blog um, during the Fulbright mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. Um, which actually sort of tried to retrace his steps every place he went for the innocence abroad. And he didn't go to any of the tourist places, or he went only briefly to them. He went to all, he went to the morgue, and then, you know, went to, I mean, he went to all of the, like, gory, awful, he went to see the can-can, right? And pretended, by the way, that, you know, it's a wonderful, famous passage that he's sort of peeping through his fingers at the can-can at this horrible, shocking dance. But, you know, this is a guy who was up in the Sierra Nevadas in the saloons, when there was some pretty wild dancing going on, and it's just not believable to me, right? So, um, so back to the blog. Um, I wrote in that that I thought he was perhaps the first France basher, and I had a lot of French friends, were you one of them, Claire, who said to me, he wasn't the first, and they would cite these other people. But I would cite Thomas Jefferson, and you know, uh, Washington and Lafayette, and all of the ways in which before Twain, overall, most Americans had a favorable impression of France. Yeah. And Twain went abroad, you know, after the Civil War with that trip, at a time when middle class and upper middle class Americans, many could go abroad for the first time. And if they couldn't, they would read about it with Twain being quite self-consciously the representative of that group. And he was writing to them. They, you know, this was a rhetorical strategy. They were his audience. He was writing to the people who weren't the very upper upper class, but were the new, newly, you know, the people with some new found resources after the Civil War, who were interested in going abroad or maybe could go abroad. And he wrote about them with what he said was sort of, a, you know, a, an average person's, an average American's outlook. And I do think, and you know, when you go online and you just Google Mark Twain hates France or you know something like that, you get like millions of things in you know a minute. Because he's so widely read and quoted today, mm -hmm. his motivational quotes, yeah. his quotes of yeah. common sense not being so common and all of that. He's so he's uh, people are reading him today, then they're being informed. I think that's yeah. really true. Yeah, and you again, if you go online and you you look at it, people quote this. People who are, you know, France bashing in one way or another often still quote Twain, mm -hmm. and they did especially with you know the, uh, you know the uh, Freedom Fries. Remember the Freedom Fries? Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. He French it, surrender he, monkeys. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so yeah, I, that was my. 
sort of original thought about this was that he, but again, there were, there have been other people. He's not been alone. You know, I think that really they are, you know, the, our countries are like, um, it's like a sibling, sibling rivalry. You know, we are two cultures who had revolutions at a similar time, have similar kind of ideals about things, have, and need to um, distinguish each other, um, d distinguish uh, ourselves from each other, and I think have a tendency to, I mean, I have two sons, and any of you who have two kids, and I think it's more so with only two kids, you see that one stakes out this position, and the other stakes out that position on identity. And I think that's kind of what goes on between the Americans and the French. Yeah. Was there a backlash? French people reacting to Oh, um, Yeah. You know, French people seem to have been largely blissfully unaware of this. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was in France for the Fulbright, I would just, I got into this sort of woman on the street thing, right? Wherever I went, I'd say to people, do you know Mark Twain? Mark Twain is like I'd be coming out of the cafe or I'd be coming out of the, you know, BNF. I mean, a range of places or a museum. And uh, usually what would happen is they would burst into a song about Tom Sawyer. They'd start singing, Tom Sawyer, and they'd sing this whole, you know, this, this whole song. And it turns out that this was, um, you know, a French TV show that had several, kind of like Batman maybe in the U.S., had several iterations. And uh, everyone knew it. Everyone from people who were 60 to people who were, you know, 20, all knew this. Um, so they had that idea of it. And of course it's saying Tom Sawyer is the symbol of liberty, right? And um, also I, I did some lectures that year at various campuses in France. And I've had, I developed a little questionnaire that I passed out that at, these were graduate students in these classes that asked them what they'd read, um, what they knew about Twain, what they read of Twain. And it turns out that um, in the French educational system, there are you know quite strict curriculum, lists of things that you read. And Twain hadn't been on it for many years, authors cycle on and off. So many um, French people really know about Twain the way, you know, uh, someone might know about Marilyn Monroe and never seen one of her movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there wasn't much that. There was some backlash in his, in his day um, that concerned a translation of his by Therese Benson, but that's a long story. I probably don't want to go into right now. It's a really, <coughs> a really minor uh, editing question. <coughs> How do you decide whether it's Twain or Clemens in your... Oh, uh, yeah. <coughs> The usual thing is you use Sam when he's a kid, when he's, you know, in his childhood. You use Clemens when you're talking about his private life, and you use Twain when you're talking about his writing. So with letters, for instance, you might refer to him as Clemens. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.